during my time of prayer, during my time of worship, I began to hear the Lord declare this. The generational curse has been broken. I am opening the eyes of my people to the truth and the reality of who they truly are. My people have battled with an old nature for too long and have spent their strength fighting instead of living in victory. How long will you fight with the old when I've already deposited the new? How long will you look at the curse when the nature that, is, that resides inside of you is blessing? I began to sense in the atmosphere that the Lord wanted me to share this word. The generational curse has been broken. We are not a people of a lineage of curse. We're a people of a lineage of blessing. The Bible says in John chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, and I'm going to begin to break this down. It says, now Jesus, as, at, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Verse 2 says, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I'm telling you, when you are living a life of self-righteousness, when you are living in an old covenant, when you are living in a place of the old and not dwelling in the new, this always seems to happen. Religion always looks for who to blame, who to point a finger at, and who to declare is cursed. The question the disciples were asking Jesus is who is cursed? His family or him? Who sinned that this, that this infirmity would reside in his house? His parents or was it him? They, they were standing before Messiah, the one who is the blessing, the one who was promised from generation to generation, understanding that he was the second Adam, the one who would break the curse and establish the righteousness of God. But yet they're asking him, through a religious mindset, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Religion always wants to know your sin. A broken system will always want to see why it's broken, why your life is broken, why the people are hurting, and how long they would remain in that condition. Religion always operates in this manner, I'm righteous as long as I keep pointing out the sins of others. That's what the Pharisees practice. That's, that's what the religious system of the time practice. As long as I can stone somebody to death, it makes me look more righteous. It makes me look more humble. It makes me look like I'm living a life according to the purpose, according to the scripture, according to the righteousness of God. But the truth is, I'm living in sin. But the truth is that the minute that I judge one, the Bible says I will be judged with the same measure. That's what Jesus is teaching is, and that's what he's breaking off of the church of his disciples, is to understand the reality that we are not a cursed people, that we are a people that walk in the blessing of God. I'm telling you that this system will always want to point out the failures of one to lift another up. If I could say, well, there's 10 people worse than me, that puts me at, the, at, at one spot higher than all the other. But can I tell you that God isn't looking to condemn? He isn't looking to hurt his children. He's looking for a people that would say, I need help. He's looking for a people that need to understand that they're loved. A people that want to experience God's power, his presence, the anointing over their life, a covering like a blanket. I'm telling you, God is looking to find a way out for those that are captive, for those that are feeling stuck. He's looking to show the path out. 
Stop thinking the way of the old and put on the lenses of the new. Stop thinking the mentality of who sin and say, is God going to manifest? Who sin or is God going to heal? Understand that Jesus was simply trying to heal the man. He wasn't trying to see who sinned. He wasn't trying to point fingers. Well, it was his grandma. Well, it was his great grandma. Well, it just happens to be that the minute he was born, he sinned. Can I tell you that we all come from a fallen nature. We all came from Adam. We all came from a lineage that had a curse upon them. But the reality is that Jesus wasn't coming to bring the curse to pass. He was coming to bring the solution. He was coming to bring the blessing. He was coming to this earth to show us that we can live a curseless life. I'm telling you, verse 3 says this, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. So your theology, Peter, so your theology, John, where did it go? If... If you're asking who sinned, and I'm telling you none of them sin, what is happening? He says this, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. That God would manifest his power through his life. That he would be a living testimony of the power of God. I'm telling you today, there's so many people in the chat and watching online that are saying, I'm cursed. And God is saying to you today, neither your parents nor you sinned. But what's happening in your life is simply for the power and the manifestation of God to come to pass. It's for the glory of God. It's for God to reveal himself in humanity. Can I tell you that the minute that Adam sinned, the minute that he was cast away from the garden, God had a plan. His plan was to restore. His plan was to redeem. His plan was to bring his children back. We see it once again, the, the end from the beginning. Adam is in the Garden of Eden. You go to the book of Revelation, and what does Jesus say? You can eat from what? From the tree of life. You can eat from that which was prohibited. You can eat and rejoice and enter in to that place that was off limits. God is telling you today, I've come to redeem those that are lost. I've come to break the curse of Adam. I've come to break the things that, that have passed from, from generation to generation to generation. The curse is broken. The curse has been broken in Christ. God wants to reveal himself by and through your life. Verse 4 says, I must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. And then he says this very powerful scripture that's going to open the eyes of many here today. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as Jesus lives, as long as he resides in his people, as long as you and I dwell on this earth, we have a light. And his name is Jesus. We're not talking about the son, S-U-N. We're talking about the son, S-O-N. As long as he li lives and resides and abides and, and is with us, we are the light of the world. So we're not in darkness no more. We're not in, 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 in an abyss. We're in his glorious light. I'm telling you today, some of you need to understand that he lives through you. Some of you need to understand that Thais Torres, that Israel Lopez, that Melissa Vigil, we all died. It is now Christ who lives. I'm telling you today, if you live fighting a no nature, if you live fighting the enemy, you're wasting all your strength. You're wasting all your energy. 
I spoke to a man this week and he asked me, what do you mean I'm wasting my energy? And I said, well, when does a battle end? When does a war end? Well, one of you have to die. When is gonna, when, are you going to kill Satan? I asked him and he said, no. So why are you fighting him? Why are you spending so much time and energy and strength going into this warfare if you're not going to kill him? The battle ends when one dies, doesn't it? Well, let me tell you this. You already died. <laughs> and let me tell you that Jesus turned the fl he flipped the script on the enemy. The Bible says if they would have known that through him dying on the cross, redemption would come, they wouldn't have killed him. They wouldn't have crucified him. They wouldn't have taken him and beaten him because it was the purpose and the plan of God. Let me tell you that you died with Christ. And the one that resurrects is Jesus. The one that now lives is Christ. So let me tell you that the, the script has been flipped. We're trying to fight this old nature. We're trying to fight this curse, not knowing that Christ already beat it. Not knowing that he already redeemed us. Not knowing that he already paid the price for your victory. I'm telling you today, if you understand that, we, our prayer would change. Our life would begin to shift from this mentality. I'm going into spiritual warfare. I'm entering into a 40-day fast. I got to pray for 24 hours in a row. And, it, uh, and all you would begin to say is this, I'm victorious. I know who I am. I know where I stand. I know what resides inside of me. I know that I am the light of the world. I'm telling you today, if, if we begin to shift our prayer, we begin to change the mentality of fighting and living through a victorious life in Christ Jesus, everything in your life is about to change. Everything in your life would shift. I'm telling you today, that prodigal that you've been praying for and you've been fighting with the demonic and you've been fighting with the spirits and you've been fighting with this, that, and the other, God is telling you, I already gave you the victory. It's not your fight. It's not your battle. He already made us victorious. Understand that the Israel Lopez died and the one who now lives is Christ. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you come to the realization that Christ is the one who lives, everything in your life changes. Verse 6 says, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Why did Jesus spit on the ground? Why did Jesus spit on the dust of the earth? Why did he grab the mud that he made and put it on his eyes and then sent him to go wash? Could it be that what kept him blind was an Adamic nature? was a nature of Adam who was made from the dust of the ground, who was made from the earth. And that very thing, the generational curse, it wasn't him or his parents, it was Adam. But Jesus came to be the second Adam. He came to redeem. He came to restore. He came to heal the blind and, and remove the veil from Adam and let them see in the spirit. I'm telling you today, when Jesus tells this man, go and dip, what is water symbolic of? We could all put it in the chat, in the comments. It's the spirit of God. When you become a man that dips in the spirit of God and dwells in the spirit of God, the Adam nature lives no more. When you become a man that walks by faith and not sight, when you become a man that walks in a victorious lifestyle, not, not fighting demons, not arguing with them, but understanding 
that Christ gave you the victory, you're no longer in Adam. You're in Christ. So the curse that Adam brought to this earth, the curse that Adam brought has been washed away. I'm telling you today, the curse is being washed. It's being washed away. It's being removed. It's being taken out. It's being cleansed. Jesus spits on the ground, removing an old nature and establishing the goodness of God. The old nature of Adam is what keeps us blind. It's what keeps us living. Well, one day I'm good, Lord, and the next day I fail. Well, one day I feel holy, and the next day I feel like a sinner. Well, one day I'm doing good, and the next day I'm watching pornography. Well, one day I'm living righteous, and the next day I'm picking up the drugs again. Well, one day I'm doing this, and the next day. Why is it? Because you're living with one foot in Adam and one foot in Christ. When Christ is saying, step in to the victory. Step in to every promise, every spiritual blessing that I have for you. Understand that the nature of Adam is gone. Understand that the sinful nature, the nature of unholiness, the nature of unrighteousness, that nature is dead. And now what lives is the nature of Christ. Now what resides is the nature of Jesus. I'm telling you, it's time to step in. It's time to abide. It's time to live. Christ took the curse away and he established everlasting blessing. We live in a blessing. We reside in the blessing. We abide in it. We are the 42nd generation, the generation in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says it, what, what is going to be a summary to this message. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a living, a life-giving spirit. We have the flesh, we have the spirit of God. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterwards, the spiritual, verse 47 says, the first man was of the earth, made of what? Made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. I'm telling you, there's two men being portrayed here. One made of flesh, one made of the dust, one made of the earth, and one made of the spirit of God. I'm telling you, which one, the question is, which one will you choose to live in? Under what kingdom would you choose to reside? Which nature do you want to carry for the rest of your life? As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. What it's saying there is simple. You can either be Adam or you can be Christ. You could either look like Adam, walk like Adam, smell like Adam, or you could reside in the blessing of God. I'm telling you, when you abide in Adam, you're always fighting sin. You're always fighting an old nature. You're always fighting the thoughts. You're always fighting the mentality. You're always fighting the drugs. You're always fighting the addiction. You're always fighting the gangs. You're always fighting. But when you live in Christ, you're victorious. There is no more fighting. There is no more struggle because you're in Christ and he has made you victorious. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God, not by our strength, not by our might, but through Christ Jesus. It says this in verse 49, and as we have borne the image or we've carried the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. <laughs> I'm telling you, you could carry the image of Adam or you could carry the image of Christ. Which image will you carry? Which will you haya become? Which one of these men will you choose to reside in and live in and have your being either in the curse or in the blessing? 
I'm telling you, I want to live in the blessing. I don't want to live in the curse. I don't want to live in a fallen nature. I don't want to live in this, in this place and reside where there's filth, where, where there's death. When Christ gives us life, he's a life-giving spirit. I'm telling you. The Bible makes it very clear in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam fell, death came in. It makes it very clear that when Adam fell, access was denied. And what does Jesus do? He comes to restore. He comes to bring life. He comes to give of his spirit. I'm telling you today, if we keep on abiding in this fallen nature, we're not living in the blessing. We're not living in the generational blessing that we're preaching. We're living in a generational curse. Where does your family reside? That's the, the big question. We know that in the book of Joshua, it says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. But it seems that my house doesn't serve God. It seems that my house is cursed. It seems that, that every time I preach, people want to say, shut up, preacher. Oh, he's a holy one. Oh, he's the righteous one. Oh, he's the one that, that, that is always holy and walks upright. No. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. What does that mean? It means that they abide in the kingdom now. How is it that I could reside in the kingdom of God, but my, my, my mentality is still in Adam? No, if I am in the kingdom of God, I have God's mind. I have Jesus' thoughts. I have godly thoughts. If I am in the kingdom of God, every, everything I do must be godly. Everything I do must show a lifestyle of worship. Everything I do must be done unto the Father. I was talking to a friend of mine and he said this. He said, when you reside in the righteousness, when you reside in, in, in God, when you know that he is your father and that you're in the kingdom and you abide there, you'll even clean the trash can. And I'm saying, what? He's like, yeah, you'll clean the trash can because everything you do, you're doing it as unto God. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you understand that you abide in the kingdom of God, your job, your nine to five, it becomes kingdom work. When, when you understand that you are a carrier of glory, a carrier of presence, that you abide in the kingdom your mechanic job, you're a worshiper. Your instruments that you use, it's no different than the piano on the stage. It's an instrument of worship. Why? Because you show the glory of God. You manifest his presence. You manifest his, his, the honor that is for him. I'm telling you, your family lives in the kingdom. Why? Because you're the head of the household. Why? Because you're the head. So where the head abides, the whole body resides. I'm telling you, this is the moment to understand that the unrighteous husband is made righteous by, by the righteous woman. And the unrighteous woman is made righteous by the abiding husband, the one who lives in the righteousness of God. That's what the scripture tells us. That's what it teaches. So I'm telling you, that husband you've been praying for, the one who still picks up the bottle and picks up the drugs and does this and that, if you're the righteousness of God and you're married and, and you have become one, understand this, your righteousness makes him righteous. There's always a question. If a soap falls on the ground, <laughs> Does the soap become dirty or does the ground become clean? I'm telling you, God is saying if the unrighteous is married to a righteous woman, he's made righteous. So there's the mystery solved. You are cleansed. You are redeemed. The curse has been taken away. I'm telling you today, understand this, that you abide in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, nobody can enter. Nobody could come and steal your blessing. Nobody could take away the righteousness. Nobody could pull you back into this 
fallen nature. You cannot have the corrupt seed of God. It's incorruptible. It cannot come back. <laughs> Understand that when you step in with a full heart, when you give him your everything, you can never go back. The Bible says, for those that are saying, I want to go here, I want to go there, it says there's no more sacrifice for you. What does that mean? It means that Jesus isn't going to come again and die for those who are in the Adam nature, in the fallen nature. He already did it. He already came and gave his life and presented himself as the one ultimate and only sacrifice. Why then do we choose to live in the muck and the mire? Why then do we choose to abide there when all the blessings have been released? You can live in the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, there's so many people that are dealing with infirmity. And I want to touch this scripture simply because Jesus healed the blind man. I want to touch on this for this reason. Every infirmity that came from Adam, the minute you step into Christ has to be removed. It has no authority. It has no power. It has no dominion over your life. Think about that for a second. If this is the kingdom of God, do you think there's people that are blind? Do you think there's people that cannot hear? What are these sicknesses? Well, they're just a shadow. They're just a picture. Well, blindness, I can't see. I can't see the things of God. If you're deaf, I can't hear his voice. Understand this, that when you come into the blessing, all these things are healed. The blindness is taken away. The sickness is removed. The infirmity, it says, by his stripes, you've been made healed. You've been made well. You've been restored. You've been redeemed by his stripes. So when I abide in this place, in this holy moment, nothing else matters. There's no sickness in my body. I'm telling you, I'm residing in presence. You can be there too. You can reside in the holiness of God, presenting yourself before him day and night, night and day, and you would understand that in his presence, nothing else matters. In his presence, you're healed. In his presence, you're redeemed. In his presence, everything in your life is in order. Why? Because everything is from him and everything is for him. I'm telling you today, you can abide in the presence of God. Live in the blessing, dwell in it, reside in it, and nothing else matters. You're no longer fighting sin. You're living in victory. What I want to release to you today is simple. God is saying, live a victorious life. Do not live in the curse, but reside in the promise that he has for you. Live in victory. It's so easy to say, but it, why is it so difficult to do? Because we're always fighting an old nature. So you want to get to the root cause of all your problems? You want to get to the root cause of why it feels cursed? Are you living in that nature? Are you living in the old? Are you living in, in, in an, an older covenant, a covenant with less promise? Or are you abiding in the new, a better covenant, one that gives you every spiritual blessing in Christ? I'm telling you, if you're residing in sickness, begin to believe for more. One thing is going to the doctors. One thing is going here, going there, taking pills, doing this. But another thing is saying, I am going to receive my healing because I'm going to dwell in the holy place. I'm going to dwell in with the most high. And when you dwell there, I'm telling you, everything in your life begins to change. What I want to do right now is close this message and begin to pray for those that are on here. I'm going to do what, what God is telling me to do. He's saying begin to prophesy. Why is it? Because I feel my ears. They're suddenly getting, they're suddenly getting clogged. And what is the Lord telling me? He's telling me there's somebody on the chat today 
that needs to receive healing, that their ears would be open and they would hear the voice of God, that their ears would pop. And just like that, healing broke out. Just like that, healing broke out. I'm telling you, before I came on this stage, I was dealing with this back issue. And I told my friend, I said, brother, do me a favor, pray for me. My back is hurting and I'm about to go preach. Pray for me. And he said, come on, let's do this right now. And he began to pray and he said, the minute that I tap your back, you'll be healed. And he did it. And instant healing broke out. I'm telling you right now, instant healing is breaking out in your family because you're going from a place of curse to a place of blessing. 